Okay. So like she said, my name is Jackie Kraftcheck, which I'm sure a lot of you might recognize me from my role at the Chamber of Commerce. I am not there any longer. Um, I actually run, I, I have a day job, but my passion is really my LLC. I do um, leadership training, consulting. And through that, I use a lot of what I'm talking about today in my leadership training, consulting. So this, this topic that we're going to talk about is really important to me. Um, but I want to start out with a story, and I'm going to apologize in advance because it's sad. But it's hard to talk about resilience without talking about difficulties and sad stories. Um, so June, mid-June of 2018, um, I, it was a Saturday. I had gone to bed around 10 p.m., which was very odd for me on a, week, a weekend evening. Um, that was quite early for me. Um, but for whatever reason, I didn't have something going on. So I went to bed at 10 p.m. I'd been asleep for about two hours. It was just after midnight, and my cell phone rang. Um, which wasn't totally unusual because um, typically I'd still be out back in 2018 at midnight or just after. But I kind of rolled over and I looked and I saw it was my brother. He um, He's in the trucking business and he owns a trucking company. Um, he So if you're familiar with that industry, they're trucking at all hours of the day and night. He had one of his dispatchers that helped him was also named Jackie. So it was not uncommon for him to call me and accidentally call the wrong Jackie. So I kind of figured the conversation would be something like, hey, it's your sister. Is this an accident? Did you mean to call the other Jackie? And he would laugh and say, sorry, sis, go back to sleep. And I would say, I'm going to get you back for this. And then I'd hang up and it'd be okay. Instead, though, what I heard was Liz and Chris were in an accident. Liz didn't make it. Call mom. You flip to the next slide, please. So, uh, yes. Um, the story is my, my sister is Liz, Elizabeth, um, her and her husband were coming back from, they were really into mudding and wheeling, and they were coming back from a whole day of wheeling and, and mudding and playing around in, the, in a competition, and they were hit by a drunk driver, um, and she didn't make it, and you can see they hit the passenger side, and that is why she didn't make it. Um, so go ahead and get off the slide so we don't have to look at it anymore. <laughs> um, that really tested resilience for our family. Um, but it wasn't that long prior to this that I actually lost a cousin to gun violence. Um, that example of watching my family go through something like that and another family go through something like that really demonstrated to me that some people are more resilient than others. So watching my mom go through that experience and losing a child she, of course, grieves still to this day. I mean, I think what mother wouldn't, right? Um, but she's been able to look at the, the big picture, appreciate the 38 years that she had with my sister, and think about the positive times, go to the appropriate support and grief groups, um, reach out to friends as needed, do all of the things that she needs to do to move on with her life. My aunt, on the other hand, who lost her son to the gun violence, uh, oh, and important too to know that my mom actually forgave the driver. Um, on the other hand, you have my aunt who lost her son, who is angry to this day. She's bitter. She has not forgiven the driver or that driver, the shooter or his family. She very much hates them all. Very, very angry, bitter, um, may even have turned to substances at some points to get herself through that. So all through my life, there's been this, this question, and it wasn't always just about resilience, but questions of why do some people get into a leadership role and do really well and others bomb it? Why do some people um, make it through something you know, tragic and kind of propel themselves forward after while others let it define the rest of their life? Um, why can some people handle losing a job and others fall into some sort of depression? Why do some people handle change so much better than others? And so these thoughts and these questions were always in my mind. This situation definitely elevated those thoughts. Um, and so I spent a lot of time researching resilience because I thought, well, that's the answer, but what is it really about it? Um, and everything I read made a lot of sense, but it really wasn't until I was doing research for my leadership development stuff that I do with my LLC that something really clicked for me. Um, I was building a workshop about the emotionally intelligent leader, and I just thought, that's the answer. It's emotional, it's not resilience, it's emotional intelligence that is getting people through these difficult situations. So we can stop right now because I'm gonna tell you the key to resilience is emotional intelligence, the end. No, <laughs> we're gonna go into that a little bit more. But I thought that this makes so much sense. So to define 
um, resilience. So it's a toughness. It's our ability to bounce back quickly from a difficulty. Um, it's important to our lives because we all face difficulties, different um, ranges, of course, of difficulties throughout our lives where we all face difficult times and we have to learn to battle through them. We can't let our difficult times define us, tear us apart or consume us, yet some people do. So re resilience is really a toughness. That's my favorite definition. Um, emotional intelligence, on the other hand, the definition, it's the capacity to be aware of, control, and express our emotions and to handle our interpersonal relationships judiciously and em empathetically. So when I discovered this emotional intelligence and made the leap from just the emotionally intelligent leader to no supplies to our lives in every single aspect of them, that's when I realized the key to resilience truly is emotional intelligence. So I want to talk about emotional intelligence. I want to talk about um, the components to it and how we can improve it um, and some things that I see with emotional intelligence in our society going forward. So if you want to go to the next slide. So basically, there are five components to emotional intelligence. Now, Daniel Goleman, which I just need to give credit where credit is due. You don't need to remember his name, um, but he's really the I don't know, a founding father, I guess you could say, but he's done a ton of the research on emotional intelligence. Um, these five components were developed by him and they're very widely accepted now. But basically emotional intelligence um, has five parts. There's self-awareness. So this is when you can see your own patterns of behavior. You can identify your own motivations. You know how your emotions and actions impact others around you. You can name your emotions so you know what it is you're feeling. You can say and describe what it is. Um, you know why you have your emotions, you know your triggers, and you know your limitations. And an example of this is when I worked at the chamber, I, it took me a little while to realize that I was not a good listener. Um, it's not because I didn't want to listen, it's because I let myself get distracted very easily with email dinging and cell phone dinging and um, things in my head. There was so much information all the time. So it actually took me, first of all, I had to become self-aware of that, but then I had to figure out what to do about that because it wasn't fair to my team. Um, so what ultimately I ended up doing is either if I could turn or put my laptop cover down, flip over my cell phone, face the person and say, OK, let's talk now. But if the confusion was in my head or the complications were in my head, then I would say to them, you know what? I cannot listen to you right now. I can't give you the attention you deserve. This isn't an emergency. So let's schedule this for two o'clock in the conference room when I can give you my full attention. So that self-awareness is being aware of how your um, yourself and your emotions are impacting others. The second um, component of the five is self-regulation. You can regulate your emotions according to the circumstances. You don't need to, for example, walk out of a meeting in anger because your pen runs out of ink. You know that that circumstance, that's not appropriate in that circumstance. Um, but I've seen it happen with other people. Something so little and so petty gets them so angry and they have kind of a, an outlandish response to it. Um, but you might if you're emotionally intelligent, think it's okay to walk out in a meeting if you get bad news or if the um, host of the meeting disrespects you or you know something like that happens, your emotional intelligence would tell you when it's appropriate to walk out and when it's not, and you can distinguish between those things. Uh, so emotionally intelligent people can think before they act and consider consequences. Now, I will say, I think that I'm relatively emotionally intelligent, but something that I heard all the time as a kid was, Jackie, was you think before you speak? So I think my emotional intelligence probably had to develop in great leaps over the years. Just ask my mom about that. Um, the third component of the five is motivation. Um, you're inspired to accomplish goals. You know what motivates you toward goal achievement. You can persist in the face of frustration and you're resilient, right? So that's where the word actually comes into the very um, discussion and words about emotional intelligence. But for example, a, a project hits a road bump, um, low emotional intelligent people might just give up and say, you take it over. I'm not doing this anymore. High emotional intelligent people are going to say, let's regather, regroup, figure out a way through this. Right. So, and again, back to the resilient thing and the difference between my mom and my aunt, that that's what they did. They had this, um, motivation and resilience to get through that. My mom did. And the other woman is not so much, uh, fourth is empathy. So you have self-interest, but you're not self-centered. So a topic is important to you and it matters to you, but it's not all about you. And you can distinguish between those two things. You understand where others are coming from and you can draw from your own knowledge and experiences to put yourself in the shoes of others in situations you're not familiar with or haven't experienced. You're not judgmental 
And you kind of live life thinking we're all doing the very best that we can with what we have. Um, so for, I do a lot of this for businesses. So that's where some of my examples are, but um, a leader whose team or who understands that when their team leaves them for the day, they spend, I don't, I don't know, my math isn't very good, 18, 16 hours, whatever it is <laughs> outside of that workplace. And things happen in that time. They have trouble with kids. They have trouble with spouses. They um, maybe get a fender bender, whatever it might be. A leader with high emotional intelligence understands that that's going to affect how they show up the next day. So instead of just saying, leave your personal stuff at home, they work with them on that and they understand that that stuff happens. That's emotional intelligence. Um, and then the last component is social skills. So you're good at working in teams. You can communicate effectively. Others don't feel awkward when interacting with you and you understand social cues. Uh, there's actually a statistic that says um, in our success in our careers, only 25% of it can be attributed or um, connected to your IQ level. So your intelligence quotient, up to 75% of it, of your success is actually attributed and connected to your emotional intelligence level. And that is, you know, that is so true from what I see and what I witness. So in social circumstances, if you can think of that person who you might say, oh, they're so smart, but they're socially awkward. Have you ever thought of that or that person? That's because their IQ level is really high, but their emotional intelligence, in the, at least in the social skills component, is not where it should be. Um, and so they're actually less likely to do well in their career than somebody, unless they're just sitting by themselves all day doing, you know, maybe research or whatever it may be. But if they have to be social in their job, they're not going to do that well. Um, so when you can flip to the next slide, I got to remember to say that. Um, so what can you expect if somebody has high emotional intelligence? What can you expect from them? And here I have a whole list of things I'll go through. Um, but emotionally intelligent people have higher self-confidence and they're more realistic about themselves. Have you guys heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? If you've read any of my columns, you've heard of it because I've written about it. But um, the Dunning-Kruger effect, it's a cognitive bias. So it's something that happens in our minds that says the less ability that someone has in something, the more they overestimate how well they know that topic. And if you think about it and the person in your life or people in your life who you say, oh, they're such a know-it-all. That's the Dunning-Kruger effect. The less they know, the more they think they know. Um, but emotionally intelligent, you know those people, don't you? <laughs> the emotionally intelligent people, though, they're more realistic about that. And they're willing to say, I don't know much about this topic, or I'm not very good at this. And that's OK. I can learn about it, or I don't want to learn about it. And they're just real with that. And they're um, authentic with what they say about that. So emotionally intelligent people are more realistic about themselves. Um, they can also more easily shift gears and lighten the mood for not just themselves, but for others. Um, but they are not going to make inappropriate jokes in an attempt to lighten the mood. They know which situation requires which level of humor. So I would say you probably don't tell the same jokes to your friends as you might like in your church group or something like that, you know, or you're not going to tell your grandchildren the same thing that you you know would say to your friends. Right. So they they know those differences and they know how to lighten that mood and add humor or distract from something that's going on. Um, I have, there's a, a business that I work with, with my LLC and there's, it's a dad and a son is um, kind of going, stepping into the family business. The dad is incredibly hard on the son, like so hard on the son, more than he is on anyone else that he works with. Um, you can tell when, when the group is communicating together and the dad says something that's really hard on the son and everyone else is awkward. Like this is uncomfortable for us. We don't like it, but you could tell who the emotionally intelligent person is in that situation. Cause they're most likely to say something like, so where are we at on that agenda now? You know, and they'll kind of transition it out of that or make some light humor or something instead of everyone just freezing out of awkwardness. Um, emotionally intelligent people are more in tune with others, which leads to better relationships. So they know that if their partner comes home at the end of the day and they had a bad day, that is not the time to say, you didn't take the trash out this morning, right? They know that that's not that important in that moment when they're already angry to bring that up, right? Um, they can more easily understand others' points of view. So they are not likely the ones on social media getting into heated battles about politics. Um, it drives me nuts how much how little emotional intelligence is on social media. Oof, drives me nuts. Um, but they can very they can more easily say, let's have a conversation about this instead of just attack each other about this topic. 
Uh, they can more quickly read a room and find and add value in a situation. So it doesn't matter what they go to, what event, um, whatever it is, even if they don't want to be there, they can go into it and very quickly realize how they can gain value from it. But they will also likely leave value for one or more people in that room as well. Uh, they are more connected to who they are and what they want in life. So they're nearing or at the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Do you guys know what Maslow's hierarchy is? So real quick, I'll just, so we're on the same page. Um, so Maslow basically said, doesn't matter what decade you lived in, what century, doesn't matter what country you live in, all humans are sort of motivated by the same things. And it's a tier system. So if you don't have the bottom tier fulfilled, then you cannot move to the next tier until that base tier and then the next tier and the next tier is fulfilled. So the base tier would be your physiological needs. So if you're going home hungry and you don't have food on the table, you're not going to be able to get to the next level until you find a way to get food in your belly or a roof over your head. Um, once you do that, the next tier is safety. So if you, yes, you have food every day, but if you don't feel safe in your environment, you're not going to go to the next level, which is love and belonging. And then all the way up to, there's a couple more levels. The top though is self-actualization, which is basically achieving one's potential. So you are living out your purpose. You are doing what you are meant to be doing on this earth. That's where the most emotionally intelligent people, that's where they exist on that Maslow's hierarchy is that they are living their purpose. Um, and you can fluctuate between the levels, but they are almost always going real close to that if they're not already in it. Um, emotionally intelligent people can purposefully enhance areas of their life so they can on purpose create better relationships, a better work environment, better school, a better relationship and where they worship. Apparently she thought I said her name. Uh, <laughs> there is also a proven correlation between a higher emotional intelligence um, and happiness, which makes sense given all the things I've talked about. If you have higher emotional intelligence, you find out ways you can make yourself happier, right? Uh, those who can manage their emotions, which are emotionally intelligent people, they tend to help others manage theirs as well. So if you think about the person who will maybe like freak out about something minor, what happens to everyone else around them? They all get sort of tense, especially think about it in the work environment. If the leader is um, frazzled by a deadline that they might miss or they're getting really close to, the whole team is frazzled and can't work as effectively. So emotionally intelligent people can keep that in check and not affect everyone else as well. Uh, not surprisingly, they tend to have more job satisfaction and they also tend to be more innovative, compassionate, curious, optimistic, adaptable, grateful, and balanced. So these are all very good things. Um, they can discern wants from needs and they don't always need immediate gratification. So they don't care if they don't get the newest iPhone as soon as it comes out. They know that theirs is working just fine and I don't need to spend that. I don't even know how much they are anymore, but I don't need to spend that $1,500 or whatever on a brand new phone because what's wrong with mine, right? So they don't need that, the next best thing or that immediate gratification. They can wait, they can think things through. Um, they do tend to be deeper thinkers and they um, more often think things through fully they're not one to be frivolous or um, like go on a whim and do something. And then the last one is they're often change agents. And at the very least, if they're not the one leading the change, um, they're at least more comfortable with change than others. So if you think about that whole list of things, I mean, who wouldn't want more of that in our world, right? Those are all very good things that I think if I would make the argument that if we had more of that, we would be a healthier society. Um, so Emotionally intelligent people, they don't only know how to describe what they're feeling. That's the very basic of emotional intelligence. Like you can feel something and you can describe it as anger or sadness or happiness or frustration or whatever it may be. That's the very basic. But the truth is some people were never taught how to do that or they're, in, they're not capable of doing that um, or they only know how to describe one or two feelings. It's like black, I'm happy or I'm sad and that's it, right? Emotionally intelligent people truly have the gamut of emotions and they know how, what they're feeling. They know the word to describe it, but it goes so much deeper than that. Um, if they're, if someone's emotionally intelligent, they can, and it might be unconsciously if you're really good at it, but sometimes it's consciously that we go through this process, but they name the feeling, but then they think about why they feel that way. So why, let's say, let's say a coworker gets a um, recognition and you didn't get it. And I feel, let's say I feel jealous in that case. 
I can say I feel jealous. Um, it's because I wanted that recognition. But why does that make me jealous? Like, why do why does that bother me so much? Does it is it because I feel like I'm not good enough? Like I deserve it and I should have got that. So they emotionally intelligent people can really dig into that why and figure it out. But then they also can see what actions are a result of those feelings. So okay, if I'm jealous in that that case, what are the actions that that I then take because of that. Well, I, maybe I'm rude to that person. Um, maybe I'm passive aggressive to that person. Maybe I give them the cold shoulder. Uh, maybe it motivates me to work harder next time. So they can understand what the actions are because of that emotion. And then they can also understand how those actions impact others. So if I say, then I'm passive aggressive, you got an award, I didn't, I become kind of passive aggressive to you. How does that impact others? Well, other people notice it. And it becomes a negative impact on others, not just myself. So an emotionally intelligent person can evaluate that whole situation. They don't just live through their emotions and let them happen to them. They use them for themselves. So I, in that situation, if that was me, and that's not me, that's totally made up. I, I would be happy for that person. Um, but I would be able to say, okay, I don't want to be passive aggressive. So I need to figure out the why. And I need to figure out the actions that I need to stop because of that. And what should I do differently? So I would dig in if I was emotionally intelligent and I would figure that out and I would make a change because of it. And then it becomes a better situation for myself and others. Um, so if you look back the case with my sister, um, my mom was able to understand the emotions, the grief, the sadness, the anger, all of those things toward the driver. She was able to really think through and process all of those and understand why she felt that way. Like, why do you start with sadness and then why do you transition into another feeling and another and another and she could decide the best ways for her to act in that situation um, for her own wellness and that of those around her right so okay well if i want to numb the pain and i go down this route this is what's going to happen that consequence isn't good so she could make those choices for herself my aunt on the other hand she does not seem to see the bigger picture and she doesn't seem to realize that these emotions she's having and the actions that are a result of them are actually affecting not only her, her own self and well-being, but they're hurting others in her family. They're hurting her other children and they're hurting her grandchildren, um, you know, by hating the family, not forgiving and perhaps maybe using substances to cope. That's all having a ne negative impact on her health. I mean, we see it. Um, she doesn't seem to and others as well. So she doesn't have that emotional intelligence to see that difference and how different choices could lead to a better life for herself. Um, so this can be applied to anyone in any situation that requires resilience. And there's, there's so many levels of it. You know, the example I shared in the beginning, that's a very extreme example. Um, but think about an emotionally intelligent kid fails a test. Um, they might understand the big picture of why that's not a good thing that they failed. Um, but they can also come back from it and say, okay, well, I better study different next time, or I better study next time, um, or I, you know, I need to try to do better. But a kid who's not taught to be emotionally intelligent, um, they might see it as, you know, it's all I'm capable of. I'm just going to get C's or fail the rest of my life. Um, they might blame the teacher, like, well, they didn't teach us well enough for me to pass this test. Uh, and they might not really see that importance of doing better and what that means to them. Um, an emotionally intelligent person who, say, loses a limb in an accident, they would push through physical therapy. It's painful. It's hard. It disrupts your life. But they would maybe learn how to walk again with a prosthetic limb. Then maybe learn to run. Um, then maybe run races and maybe even win races over time. That's emotional intelligence. But a person in that same situation who's not emotionally intelligent, they might spend the rest of their life in a wheelchair saying, poor me, I lost a limb, Right. So that's differences in emotional intelligent levels. Um, an emotionally intelligent person whose job is eliminated, they would see it as a temporary hurdle um, and not impossible to overcome. They might view it as a time to learn a new skill or try a new career. They would network. Um, they would learn from the situation. And then once again, eventually they'd be in a great career, probably even better than the one they were in. But a person who's not as emotionally intelligent, they would likely choose to be the victim in that situation not learn from it, blame and hate the company forever, uh, probably boycott the company. And at the end of the day, is that really going to do them any good? Maybe make them feel better, but it's not going to hurt the company. And they will likely find other work, but they would always hold a grudge against what happened to them in that situation. Um, and then the last example, I, an emotionally intelligent couple gets divorced. 
So which actually divorce rates are less likely or are lower in um, relationships where at least one, if not both partners are emotionally intelligent. Um, but let's say an emotionally intelligent couple gets divorced for whatever reason, um, they're still going to get along. They're going to treat each other with respect and they're not going to make it difficult for their children. But a couple who has low emotional intelligence, they get divorced and it's probably going to be really ugly. It's going to be a battle. Um, they may use their kids as pawns, which disgusts me. And they try to turn the kids against the other parent in that situation. And there's really never forgiveness about what happened. So no matter what, it's asking your kid, well, who's mom dating now? Well, what's dad doing now? And they never really get over that. Whereas an emotional intelligent person would say, I'm happy with what I chose for my life. Let them be happy with what they're doing with their life. So you, can you see the differences in all of these situations? And I'm sure you guys can think about um, the people you know that are in these situations. You can go on to the next slide. I just put some pretty pictures in here for you guys. Um, and it's so important that we are teaching our children um, to be resilient and to have emotional intelligence, but studies are showing the opposite is actually happening right now. It doesn't, it doesn't look well for our future if that keeps happening. Um, and statistics are already also starting to show what happens when children grow into adults without high emotional intelligence. So there is a lot of evidence right now that shows resilience has declined in young people in the last couple of years. Rates of anxiety, depression have increased and direct measures of resilience, which have been used longitudinally, so they study the same kids over a period of time, are showing declines in resilience over that amount of time. Um, some studies have shown that the two biggest culprits of those things are um, being a helicopter parent and screen time which I don't think the screen time one should surprise anybody. Um, studies also show that 95% of people think they're self-aware, but the reality is only 10 to 15% actually are. So that tells me that people are afraid to be truthful with themselves and they are the Dunning-Kruger effect. You know, they like to say they're no more or better than they are and unwilling to be, uh, look internally and really be honest with themselves. And then a study, another study said that 46% of the U.S. adult population is severely lacking in emotional intelligence. So almost half of the adult population is severely lacking. And if you think about some of our societal problems, um, I think a lot of them can be directly connected to not having emotional intelligence taught in people from a young age. So, um, so what can we do? We can't change others' behaviors, right? So what can we do to help increase resilience and increase emotional intelligence. Um, well, we can hold ourselves and others accountable. Um, we can be some people that we trust and we're friends with. We can point out to them when they're not being very emotionally intelligent or they could do something different to be more resilient. Um, we can practice. Everything good takes practice, right? So we can um, listen to some of these things and we can practice in these situations. Like I know every time I do this, I get angry. Next time that happens, I'm going to try really hard not to get angry or not to let it bother me in the way that it has in the past. Um, we can give our emotions the attention they deserve. So how, how long ago was it? When's the last time that you actually gave a single emotion the attention that it deserves to ask why you felt it, what made you feel that way, what actions were a result of it, and how those actions impacted others? You know, when's the last time you actually sought or gave yourself the time to sit and think about that? Um, now that I know so much about this topic, I do that when I'm either doing cardio exercises because I would spend my time thinking about how much it sucks to do cardio <laughs> um, or I, when I'm driving. That's a great time for me anyway to think about these things. So I might think about, okay, last 10 hours I felt angry because of this and sad and frustrated. And I'll think about those things and apply those questions to it. So give your emotions the attention that they deserve. Um, you can challenge yourself to change your perspective. Um, I know something that with that Maslow's hierarchy, something that I see happen with people is somebody is in that bottom tier or the second one and others tend to judge them like, well, just pick yourself up by your bootstraps. You can do it. Instead of changing their perception to say, no, if you didn't have food on the table, it would be really hard for you to get out of that bottom, you know, physiological needs because you're literally hungry every day. How, how could you pull yourself up by your bootstraps if you were so desperate for food every day? Um, so change, challenge yourself to change your perspective uh, when it comes to viewing and judging other people. Uh, build your emotional vocabulary. So if you, can only just, if you can only list five emotions right now, 
there's a whole lot more out there. You know, try to build that vocabulary and learn what other emotions are and what they feel like. Uh, view and treat difficulties as temporary and not permanent. Um, so if something difficult happens, whether it's a one day thing, a week long thing, or a three year difficult time in the scope of your life, it's really not that long of a time, right? So view things as a temporary um, challenge or a temporary setback and not permanent. You can see yourself and others as separate from circumstances. So don't define yourself by things that have happened in the past. And for me, um, I had an eating disorder and depression for a very long time. And that was one thing that I really struggled with is don't let that define who I am now. Like I'm not my eating disorder and I'm not a bad person for that and having that in my life. Um, so really separate yourself from the circumstances. Um, a way you can help others is model appropriate behavior. So show the youth that are in your life or even, you know, you, the, the adults that are in your life, show them what it looks like to be a resilient and strong person, an emotionally intelligent person. Um, let other people solve their problems or teach them how. And this goes back to that whole helicopter parenting thing. So let people struggle with the problem, like let them try and figure it out. Don't just, oh, I'm just going to do it for you. I know sometimes it seems easier to do that, but teaching people how to be resilient and have to struggle through that difficulty is important. Um, surround yourself with emotionally, emotionally intelligent people um, because you are what you surround yourself with, right? Uh, build your self-awareness. And then also this one's so important is be honest with yourself. So if you are the 95%, you think you're self-aware, um, but the reality is you're in that 10 to 15%, start to be very honest with yourself and say, uh, you know what? I did mess that up. Like it is my fault. It was nobody else's, but mine. Um, I could have done it differently and, and start to be very truthful and vulnerable with yourself. Um, so let me see if what slide I'm on here. Oh, you can switch like I had two, three. <laughs> Sorry. We went through that. We went through that. That's pretty. Okay. Okay. This one. Um, so my questions for you are, where are you at with your emotional intelligence? Um, if this was a whole workshop, I would actually give you an assessment to do. Uh, but there are so many online. There's some that are free, some that cost money, some that take two minutes and some that take an hour. But where are you with your own emotional intelligence? Are there areas that you can improve in? Um, when is the last time you gave your emotions the time that they deserve for that evaluation? Because that's so powerful if we do learn to do that. Are you honest and vulnerable with your self-assessments and insight? Because you can take all the assessments you want. If you're not being honest, they don't matter. Um, I always say, I'm a quote person, but I always say, if you just hang quotes up all over, if you're not really applying them to yourself, are they really affecting your life like you want them to, right? So you have to be willing to be honest and vulnerable. Um, how are you demonstrating resilience and emotional intelligence to others? So if people were to base their level of resilience, model it after yours, would that be a good thing for them or a bad thing? You know, so where are you at with your own resilience and emotional intelligence? Are you modeling what you would like others to mimic? And then how do you hold yourself accountable to being resilient or emotionally intelligent? Do you need an accountability buddy? Do you need someone to say to you, hey, you really need to be more resilient and here's how we can make that happen. You know, I always think of the rubber band, like you need to snap yourself with the rubber band when you show yourself you need to make a change in your life, right? Um, and then also, are you willing to change? Because if you're not, then you probably shouldn't even come to this presentation. But <laughs> I mean, you have to be willing to actually make those changes. And that's hard for people. You know, we, know, we all know the people that um, struggle to change in life. So um, you can go ahead and go to the next one. Uh, so I'm at the point, um, I don't know how long these were supposed to be, but oh, I have lots of time. But does anyone have any questions? Yes. Yes, on emotional intelligence, I would recommend emotional intelligence 2.0. Um, they had the, uh, there's the first one and then there's the second one. It's, if you don't read the first one, it's okay. The second one I think is better, um, but you don't need to read the first to get the second. Yeah. Yeah, Renee Brown, mm. she was on CBS this morning. She's just written a book and it's showing she did was take three emotions, which would probably be difficult for us to get. Yeah. And she's focused on 30. Yes. So it makes sense to focus on. Is that a book that already came out? Is it called The Heart? Something The Heart. I'm not sure. Like it just came out. I think I, yeah, I think it's in my stack of books to read. Um, 
because that's what it's about all those different emotions, but um, she is phenomenal. If you guys are into reading, Brene Brown is phenomenal. And she talks about vulnerability as like her bread and butter, but she gets into, you know, resilience and all that stuff too. Any other questions? Yeah. I guess for a parent with children, are there tools available that help them coach their kids into it? Thinking this way or whatever. Yeah, I mean, so full disclosure, I'm not a parent. <laughs> so it's always hard for me to give parenting insight when I'm not a parent. However, I think when you research and study all this stuff, you do come up with, you know, things that would be valuable. Same thing in the class. Absolutely. Trying to generate that within a class. There are, there's a lot of resources. I mean, you could search online for that, but I think the most valuable resource is for someone to become emotionally intelligent themselves and then understand that value and how, how important that is. But I see things, and this is where my research is right now. What I'm looking into is the impact it's having on children. Um, I'm really interested in that because I fear for our future um, a little bit with some of the things that are happening, but I don't want to get political at all. Um, but when you do look at things like everyone gets an, an achievement award, you're not building, you're not building that need for a child to have to work through a challenge or the feeling of losing, like that's okay to lose sometimes. And so we need to give them situations where they have to challenge, or like I said earlier, don't do the problem for them, let them struggle to figure it out. And at some point you probably have to step in and say, well, try it this way. And what happens? Um, but to just grab it and do it for them or give them all an award so they're all equal, that doesn't, that doesn't teach them to get through challenges. And I think back to how I was raised. Um, my parents' philosophy was basically you do whatever you want, but you face the consequences. Um, you want to dye your hair pink or green, dye your hair pink or green, but know the consequences of people, you know, and that was, now it's everywhere, but then it was kind of, you know, people would look, you know, whatever. But it was always, and that's a simple example because other things were more permanent. Um, but even, I don't know if I should share, I guess I can share this, he won't care. But my brother one time had, you know, country kid, he had a gun in his vehicle and not even thinking about it, had it on school property. And it was his choice. And my mom told him, you get suspended and you can't walk with your graduation class. I'm not trying to get you out of that. But I see so many parents these days, and I was on the school board for a while, so many parents try to go to bat for their children and get them out of situations. And I just think you're not doing your child any favors because they're not having to deal with the struggles, the real struggles of life. Um, so I think there are tons of resources to answer your question. I, I can't name any, but I would say use them to become emotionally intelligent and then teach your children how to do that as well. Um, but also just let children have to be resilient instead of taking that opportunity away from them. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. I'm sorry that I came up a little short. I hope that's okay. Um, I'm always available. I think everyone knows how to find me. So if anyone has questions, you guys can Google me and find me, but always happy to chat about this stuff because I'm very passionate about it. And I honestly believe that our world would be a better place if more people understood resilience and emotional intelligence and practice it for themselves. So thank you. Um, I don't, I don't really do them. Like I don't offer them for people to just come in, but I'm hired by a lot of different clients to do them. So if sometimes those are public and sometimes they're private for the business. So you just have to pay attention to my social media to see if anything's public, if you wanted to. Yeah, attend. And talking to business owners, what, what seems to be their focus? What are they trying to work on business? Uh, well, when I do, so this has become, emotional intelligence has become a really hot, hot topic lately. And I don't know if it's like a buzzword or if people really are starting to see the importance of it. Um, but a lot of times they just want employees who are making better decisions and understanding the big picture instead of this immediate gratification. And I mean, you see, I'm going to go off on a tangent, but you see places now that are starting to pay daily instead of weekly or biweekly or whatever. And then it's like that there's no, there's no incentive there to have to learn to budget or manage your time and all of that. And so a lot of times when I get hired by businesses, they just want to create more well-rounded uh, employees who are 
happier in the workplace and know how to create happiness for themselves instead of expecting somebody else always to provide for them. Yeah, so that's really, I think, what their goal is when I do that. One of my biggest frustrations, though, is that, um, first of all, the people that need it most don't hire me, which is the case with everything, right? Um, but then second, I get frustrated, and this is not the case at all for all of my clients, but I do get frustrated when I get hired to work with the, the team members, but then the leaders don't attend. Um, that really frustrates me too, because the leaders need it sometimes more than the team members, because as a leader, they can create an environment where people are, are going to be more emotionally intelligent and they are going to thrive better if they had better leadership. So chicken and egg, right? Yeah. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I was curious. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.